it. In the last talks, the word twilight. And I want to come back to it because it is important in the kind of vision I have of things. Twilight, we experience most of it as lack of light. But at the same time, twilight means, scripturally speaking, something which is between light and darkness. Or is it, as we see in the history of creation and our expectation for its future, is it a period of <coughs> imperfect light <coughs> between two moments of brilliant light, of a light without a shade, a shadow. When we think of the creation of the world, we can think of God pronouncing a word, come, I love you. And the world emerges out of naught. It's a moment when all things created are immersed in the light of God, in the love of God. There is not an element of darkness. There is not a shadow. All is light. And we are told that Christ was the light of the world. He was the Word. He was the Creator. So that was the first moment when all things emerged out of non-existent into a plenitude of light. And of light that was coincidental with existence itself. There was nothing but light, nothing but beauty, nothing but joy, nothing but communion with Him who is light itself. And then we are expecting in the end of time, we don't know when, but one day that God shall be all in all. That history will have run its course. That good and evil will have fought their frightening fight. And one day God will have conquered and there will be nothing left but divine light pervading, filling and fulfilling all the creatures he has called into existence, all those who ever lived and were. Between these two extremes of light, perfect, without a shadow, because it is God's own light, or perhaps should I say, this light is God himself that stretches the whole history of creation. We see in the beginning of Genesis how God created all things. He looked at them and saw that they were all good, all capable of carrying the light, of communing with the light. And then came the fall. The light did not disappear, but something happened to the creation on several levels, and I want to come to those levels in a moment. The first level was that mankind lost its wholeness and therefore could not commune totally, perfectly, to light divine. I told you last time, and unfortunately I must have said it more than once, that when Adam was created, he was created like the total human being, containing, as it were, within himself all 
the potentialities of men and women, all that was humanity. And then he developed, he grew, he matured, and the moment came when the variety of possibilities that were in him could not live simultaneously in the same being. And God brought to him all the created beings, and he saw that all beings were male and female, that they were not an arithmetic one, but they were two that were one at the same time. And because at that moment, men became capable of becoming, as I mentioned last time, I think, one personality in two persons. When the primitive human was divided into Adam and Eve, they looked at one another and they did not say, oh, that's another one, like me. The remarkable thing in the Hebrew text is that they looked at one another and they said, this is Ish and this is Isha. It is me in the feminine. It is me in the masculine. It was one personality, one whole in two persons. And that was a wonder because there was no separation and yet there was in each of them what the other one could not contain to the full. And then came the fall. And as you remember, Adam and Eve looked at one another and saw they were naked. That is a moment which, is in, which indicates in the Bible that they no longer looked at one another and saw themselves fulfilled to perfection. They saw another one. What one of the saints of old describes as alter ego, the other myself. Yes, myself, but the other one. It's not me in the full sense in which I experienced the other one in the beginning. And that is a moment when the fullness of light was no longer there again. The fullness of light had gone because it could exist only in the perfect union of the two spreading all around. And the, I'm not going to describe all that the Bible says about the beginnings of this couple, but just one or two things. The first one is that, as I have just said, they saw one another as the other one. And as such, they were alienated to one another to a certain degree, while they were attracted to one another in another sense. They still longed for each other, and yet they were separated. And the Bible tells us that Adam knew Eve, Eve knew Adam. It was no longer oneness revealed. It was an attempt at reconstructing oneness on the level of nature, of affection, but no longer this ontological absolute oneness that was there. And because they no longer were this oneness revealed, an icon of the Holy Trinity if you want to, because the Holy Trinity is three persons in one person, while they were two persons in one personality. 
Because that happened, the whole world became, in their eyes and through their action, divided into individuals or into groups, alien to another. There is a passage in, I think, the third chapter or fourth of Genesis, in which, as a result of the fall of men, because they longer, no longer were oneness incarnate, their relationship to the created world changed. The Lord said, after the flood, all beasts are delivered unto thee for food. They will be your food, but you will be their terror. Man was no longer the guide of the created world to the plenitude to which it was called. It was he who had broken it, and he was he who introduced a new terror, the terror of murder, of killing, into the created world. All that is what I meant when I spoke of the twilight, of a period between the glorious creation, when there was not a shadow, and the glorious fulfillment at the end of time, when God shall be all in all. And the whole of history stretches between two ex these two extremes. But between these two extremes, the light and the shadow, the darkness and the light, combine in different ways at a different degrees. There were periods when the light shines so bright, so beautiful, that one forgets the darkness. There are periods, on the contrary, where the darkness accumulates in such a way that one asks oneself, but where is the light? In terror, in fear, in horror. At one extreme, we find love. On the other extreme, we find hatred. At one extreme, we find the emergence of life in its plenitude. On the other extreme, we find murder. Between these two, there is this period which I insistently call twilight, because I want to underline one more feature. We live in a world which we cannot imagine to be nothing but light. But it is not either darkness and nothing else. And this is the wonder of it. The light, the harmony has been broken, but it still exists. It is there. And when you think of human beings, you can see on the one hand, human beings full of evil, of hatred, of murder, accomplished or imagined. And on the other hand, saints shining with divine light. On the one hand, we find sin, which means separatedness from God. On the other hand, we find redemption and saintliness, which is the beginning of the time when God shall be all in all. And this is the time in which we live. And this is what we are. If we look at one another, or even perhaps more justly at ourselves, we can see that within each of us there is light. And within each of us there is a degree of darkness. There is light because we are capable of seeing, appreciating beauty and rejoicing in it. 
And at the same time, <coughs> we participate in darkness because there is in us a lack of love, a self-centeredness that prevents us from being one with the other. Loneliness resulting from it and beyond that all the dark feelings of dislike, of hatred and so on. The world is in this condition of twilight but we must always remember that even if the fullness of light is no longer there, light is shining. And with the incarnation, it shines in the world with renewed, creative, redemptive power. It shines in the saints. We can see in so many of the saints of East and West, light, the light of love, the light of God shining and pouring out of someone who has given himself to God, opened him or herself to God, in whom divine life abides, grows, shines. Remember the vision of Matavilov of Saint Seraphim of Sarov. He was talking to him about the spiritual life and he could not understand what it all meant. And of a sudden, in the course of his explanation, Saint Seraphim appeared to him different than he was a moment ago. He was shining with such brightness that he could not sustain the vision of it. He was shining in a blinding way. And he was afraid. And Seraphim said to him something which we must remember because it's one of the great consoling words of history. He said to him, why are you afraid? And Matavilo said to him, because you are all light. And Seraphim said to him, yes, but you could not see me as you see me now if you yourself were not in the same light as I at this moment. And this is a wonderful thing because we do not see ourselves or one another in this blinding light and then, all of a sudden, there is a moment when you look at a person and we see in the eyes, on the face, in the whole being of this person, light. I don't mean material light, although that also is there. But we can perceive something which is beyond the created. And we can see in the lives of so many saints, this very phenomenal light. And the world in which we live is in twilight, but the light is there. If we ask ourselves, what is the church? How it appears? we can easily see that on the one hand the church is a presence of God right in the middle of its creation. Right in the middle of its creation. Through the incarnation God has become part and parcel of this created world and has brought with him, in him, all the light divine which we miss 
and lose. And it's by communion with Christ that we become partaker of this light. On the other hand, the whole fullness of the Trinity abides here. The Father is never separated from the Son and we receive the grace of the Holy Spirit. We commune to all the mystery of the Holy Trinity, oh, in very different degrees of understanding, of perception. But things do not depend only on our perceiving them and our understanding them. We may be blind to the light which surrounds us. We may be insensitive to the immensity of love divine which is granted us. We may not be aware of the action of the Holy Spirit within us, transforming us, reworking us, making us capable of becoming living, live members of the body of Christ. And in a way, almost more of this than this, the world in which we live contains this presence divine, although the presence divine contains the whole world within itself. The world is a place where this presence is. And there is not one place to which the light of God, the warmth of love, divine does not reach. I have quoted to you a phrase which has deeply touched me one day when Bishop Alexis van der Mensbrugge, someone who had been a Roman Catholic Benedictine monk and became an Orthodox and eventually a bishop of the Russian Church, said, at the center of things, there's the fullness of life, of light. But the light is present in the world in the way in which if you light a candle, this candle is fire and light. But around this light and this warmth, there is an ever-decreasing amount of light as you go farther and farther. But the moment you have lift, lit a candle, the whole world, up to these extreme distances, partakes to this light. We don't perceive it anymore because it is beyond our perception. But the light reaches the extreme of the world. And the same is true about the presence of God through the church, in the church. It is there. Can we say that we, members of the church, always perceive this presence? No, we can't. We cannot say that. There are moments when we are opaque, incapable of perceiving it. There are moments when we suddenly perceive the light, the warmth, the presence. But this light, this warmth, this presence is extended to the whole world. There is not one creature, one created being or object which is not touched by it. And already now, something which could move us so deeply and which we perceive so little takes place in the liturgy. I have mentioned it perhaps to you and perhaps in my Russian talks because again it's something that I find so wonderful. 
the consecration of the bread and wine. What is this bread? This bread is made of wheat, which was sown by a human being, perhaps without any thought of making of it a sacred object. This wheat was sown, it fell on the earth, it was accepted by the earth, fed with moisture, and gradually it became a little plant, and it grew to become I can't find the word. Um, an ear of wheat. And all that was done by a human being who did not think of creating something sacred. He could, if he was mature enough, to understand that to create life is an a sacred action, but he might have done that simply to have wheat for bread. And yet, this wheat was a creation of God. And one day, it, some of it was made into bread. It was bread was brought to church by a believer in order to become part of the liturgy. The believer very often doesn't really realize what he is doing. He brings bread. But this bread is a fruit of the earth giving life of God who gave life to the earth and to the wheat. It is brought in the sanctuary and there it is consecrated. What happens then? It, it is taken by the priest in shape in the form of a cube that is an icon of Christ. This icon, this cube will be cut. The Lamb of God is immolated. And at that moment, this bread has become a tragic image of Christ, because in the world in which we live, it was death that came upon him. And then the service goes on. And the moment comes when, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in response of the faith and the prayers of the faithful, the, faith, the Holy Spirit descends upon this bread, and this bread becomes the body of Christ. In what sense? There is a passage in Khamyakov in which we must remember, which is worth remembering. He said, we speak of the body of Christ. We, dis we do not say, and he will use the word itself, we do not mean the meat of Christ. It becomes Christ. How? Because the whole world is called to become the place of the incarnation. Incarnation itself, visible, perceived, accomplished. And when we look at this bread, after the consecration, we can see a little particle of the created world that is now so united to Christ that it has become the body of Christ and Christ has become part and parcel of this simple piece of bread. And when we receive communion, we commune to this bread, which is Christ himself. 
And here we can see how from the twilight of the field in which a seed was sown through the work that was not even intended to create sacredness through an action that took something neutral, pure, unstained because the world in which we live is a victim of human sin not sinful itself but a martyr of our sinfulness is brought back to God and there it is reintegrated to the unity of God which was there in the beginning and to a unity which will be there even more gloriously at the end of time do you see how wonderful these things are I can't express them I'm sorry I'm sorry but it's so beautiful to think and to know that in this world of twilight in which we live there is this plenitude of fulfillment of light we do not see it because we are not we are blind we don't see enough but there are saints to whom it was given to see I remember a saint of Russia I can't remember his name no he was the only priest in the monastery and for years he had not celebrated because there was another priest and he felt it was too terrifying to celebrate the liturgy and one day there was no priest he was asked to celebrate after long entreaties he accepted to do it and after the service he came out and said it is the last time I have celebrated even if you need a priest find him elsewhere because I cannot experience what I have experienced today and remain alive he had entered into the world to come he had seen creation transfigured he had seen bread become Christ Christ who had become us through the incarnation so that when we think of the twilight in which we live we must remember that there is a degree of darkness but there is light and if we only only looked at one another knowing that in this person whom I don't even know in this person whom I don't understand this person whom I don't even last love or like there is always incipiently the dawn of life of light of eternity how we would treat one another how we would look at each other how much would mean to each other we would not only think of one another as icons that is a sort of painting representing something no but a real presence in this person insignificant misunderstood by us beyond our understanding the mystery of unity with God is at work in that sense the twilight is there because the person is not yet fulfilled even Saint Seraphim of Sarov was not yet fulfilled in the way in which he became fulfilled after his death but this person is already incipiently invisibly very often perceptibly very often already 
pervaded with light and life divine. Can we not try and look at one another in this light? Try to look at one another, beginning with those whom we love dearly and beyond our human tenderness, our human admiration, our human affection. Go deeper in an act of worship. This person is a place where God is alive. One of the fathers of the desert said, who has seen his brother has seen his God. Yes, he had perceived that. He knew that every person is already, incipiently, but really the incarnation. Let us think of that. I will continue on this subject of the twilight in the context of history in our, my next talks. And I hope that these talks may one day, or perhaps already now, make some sense to you, because they mean so much to me. Let us now keep quiet for a moment, pray and disperse. <laughs>